My name's Mel Perrine. I... Hey, I'm Bradley Carriage. Hi guys, I'm Louise Carriage. Um... So it's my great delight to welcome you guys here this evening to our first Zoom session. This is our See Differently series. Uh, obviously, what a great time it is in sport with the Olympics, but obviously more importantly, the Paralympics coming up. Um, we hope you've been reading, watching, listening um, and supporting our community members as they prepare for the Paralympics going forward. Um, to start off, we'd introduce each other. So I'll let Jason start um, and we'll go around our panellists. Thanks, Bella. Yeah, welcome everyone um, to this great series. Hopefully um, it kicks off really well. Um, just to give you a little bit of a background. So I've just been put into the general manager's position at Blind Sports New South Wales, um, which is great. I'm a father of a vision impaired um, athlete, Oscar Stubbs. Um, so I've grown up with him um, for his whole life of being blind. So I know a little bit about that. Have a bit of a coaching background in, in cricket. Um, more recently, the Blind Cricket New South Wales team. Um, but I've also managed the blind futsal and also the blind tennis teams. Um, I also run my own business now in NDS, um, Visionary Independent Support. So um, it's a little bit of a background on me. Um, so yeah, I'll hand it over to, to Bella now. She'll give a bit Thanks, of background. Yes. So I am the program manager of Blind Sports and Recreation. This is obviously the best way we can run a program at the moment when we can't come up to Tamworth or we can't go out to Orange or Dubbo. This is what we can do for the time being. We'd hope in another soon time period that will change. But for now, I run online programs um, and similar with Jason have launched blind football or soccer, hoping to host nationals in November, but We'll see about that. Um, I'd love to introduce our panelists for today's discussion around rural and regional living. Uh, first up, we'll chat to or get let, uh, Mel introduce herself. Um, hi everyone. So my name is Mel Perrine. I am legally blind congenitally. Uh, so I've got less than five percent of my vision, um, and I am a Alpine skier, so three-time Paralympian, currently training for my fourth games, uh, which will be held in Beijing 2022. So um, there's more, more Olympics and Paralympics to come following this year. So stay excited for next March and Feb, guys. It's going to be awesome. Um, beyond that, I have also spent eight or so years at university studying. I, ha am, I have a master's in exercise and sports science and a master's in physiotherapy as well. So, and then I live in Mittagong. I grew up in the country, um, still I'm in town, but you know, living in a rural community um, all my life as well. Um, but yeah, that, that's basically me in a nutshell. Wonderful. Uh, Brad, jump over to yourself. Hey. I'm Bradley Carriage. I'm a coach and commentator for the blind sport known as goalball. Um, I play blind cricket. I'm starting up blind golf and I also do hip hop and dance. And I'm currently studying uh, different degrees and certificates in fitness and business. Perfect. We'll get more into some of those certificates a little bit later on. Um, but before we do, we'll talk to Louise and let yourself introduce. Hi guys, I'm Louise Carriage um, from regional Tamworth and I grew up in a very small town, Narrabri, with about 13,000 people and then moved up to Queensland and that was less, like had 6,000 people. Um, so very accustomed to rural life and correspondence. Um, my love was horse riding, swimming and running and got a thrill out of that as a kid, which was fantastic. Um, moved to Tamworth in 2000, oh no, 1999 and um, worked at Canada, about an hour away from here. So very rural background and um, loved being a kid on the land. It's been fabulous. Um, I have three children and um, Bradley 
uh, who is vision impaired, has um, enjoyed sport um, as a kid. All three of my children love sport. And we're just um, working out how to incorporate sport and mental health and definitely moving forward. Lovely, what an introduction. I didn't know some of those things, Louise, especially Gunadar is, um, oh, is it Gundagai, Gunadar? Or Gunadar, yeah. Gunadar, Gunadar. yeah. Yes, oh, it's yes. a very remote but beautiful place. Yes. <laughs> beautiful. So um, we've had those intros kind of already stated where you live and Louise, you answered that. I'm assuming, Brad, that means, or you correct us, if you've always lived in Tamworth or you moved around... No, I've, I've always lived in Tamworth, <laughs> born and raised. Born and raised. And Mel, that was the same with you a minute ago? Sorry, the mute button kind of freaks me out sometimes. Um, <laughs> yeah, so I, I was actually born in Nowra, which is like a coastal rural community. And then we moved up to mid when I was about four, uh, three or four, right before I started primary school. Yeah, okay, beautiful. So then living in those communities rurally do you we'll go straight into some of the questions about traveling around currently and come back to sports um so if we stay on mel traveling around mitigong where you are at the moment how do you find you get to your workplace or you see your friends are there any technologies you specifically use for that area so i suppose living in mitigong so um I'm 33, so I've essentially lived here for, you know, 29, 30 mm. years now. Um, and it's a small town and I've got a, a pretty decent memory. Some people say I think I'm scatterbrained. But uh, so when I'm trying to walk around Mittagong or things like that, I basically map it out in my head. I know I know where every crossing is. I know what all the sidewalks feel like. Um, I work about 10 minutes walk from my house. Um, so it's really easy to get around my town. However, you know, getting anywhere outside of my town becomes a little bit problematic um, as everyone in Sydney or New South Wales is more than aware. Our rail system and public transport system is kind of, you know, it's hit or miss, but out in the country, it's even worse. Uh, so unfortunately getting in between towns to see friends and things like that. I do rely a lot on taxis, um, ride share apps, things of that sort of nature. I've got a great circle of friends as well. So, uh, and they're always more than happy to give me a lift if I need to go anywhere further out. Um, but that's basically how I get around home. Anywhere where I'm outside of Mittagong, very specifically Mittagong, um, mm. I use a cane. So I'm a, I'm a white cane user. Um, saying that, I only started using a cane in my 20s um, when I was, it was actually introduced to me by uh, one of my ski guides. He's like, you should get one of these things. I'm like, what does it even do? Like, I, I've never had mobility training. I don't know what this does. <laughs> Change my life get one if you don't they're fantastic um so yeah I that gave me a whole lot more confidence moving around outside of, of Mittagong and then if I'm outside of town I use Google Maps a lot um and Street View to kind of let me know where I am and to really orient myself with where I am and where I'm going um I found that to be uh really quite useful and very easily accessible without having to pay for it I think there's a blind app that's meant to help people out but I never found it and Google Maps works perfectly. So that's kind of how I navigate on a day to day. Yeah. Okay. So obviously you, I'll come back to the white cane, but I was going to talk to those in a second, but for Brad and Louise, maybe that Mel mentioned, obviously the, the transport, the public, you know, the trains or buses being not so accessible. Do you find the same up in Tamworth when you're that bit further from Newcastle or do you um, navigate around your work, school, friends, etc.? How do you find that? Yeah, buses aren't really a big transportation for me here in Tamworth. If I need to get around, I use my NDIS support money and pay a support worker that I know to help me get around. I also use my cane, my vision mobility cane all the time if I need to walk to a place. And Tamworth is very small. It's not that hard to walk to your destinations. But um, the train is good for leaving the town, like having to get to Sydney and to Newcastle and stuff. It's a bit of a wait, but it's that that's the main uh, transportation I use to leave the town. 
So if you're coming down to Sydney for a, a goalball comp or you've got any cricket on, or so you might so jump on the train, but yeah, on time to time. And and your siblings, are they older or younger? Are they driving you around yet? <laughs> Can you nudge them into it? They're they're a bit younger. My brother doesn't have a license, and my even younger sister will get her peas in September. <laughs> So then she can start driving me around, yeah. <laughs> and what about mum? Do you find any different planning or when Brad has to contact his NDS support worker, do you did you set that up for him and work with him for that? And then do you find any additional planning in your weekly schedule to make sure that Brad can get to his training, school, uni, work, etc.? Yes, there's a lot of planning that goes in for the week and we try and have it the same. Um, we have actually wonderful um, carers that um, are friends as well. They've become friends and they'll stay friends. Um, and also we've got family support. All those little spur the moment things. There's, we've got a very big family here and um, Bradley can just pick up the phone and go, I need, I need a lift, uh, I need to go here. And, and you're always on call. So to be able to live in the country, having family and friend network is very, very important. To, for, to rely on transport that is yeah yeah that's what I've heard because obviously if you're getting a support worker you've got to get uh, book it in a few days in advance you know plan your timings versus you know life happens things come up and you love to be able to jump just to um, those people who you can who you can lean on um, so then if we do go back to those accessibility features <laughs> What do you find, we'll go back to Mel on the white cane, what do you find, you said it was life-changing, like you told everyone to get on that. Um, what do you find the best it gives you in terms of your own self-independence? You know, what, what features do you think that others could benefit from um, if they're not already using white cane? Uh, so I think using a white cane for me kind of um it was a step that I never really wanted to take and never really considered uh when I was growing up I had absolutely no involvement or oh, I say absolutely but very little I think I had an itinerant teacher one day a week in primary school and one day a fortnight in high school and that was basically my um lead into accessibility features I didn't know large print was a thing until I was in year seven so <laughs> I thought that was quite interesting um so the thought of a, a mobility cane, like, basically didn't even cross my mind because um, I didn't realise it would help so much. I always used to walk around scraping my feet constantly. Um, I have no depth perception, so stairs look like ramps, look like holes, look like a cliff. I, I can't tell the difference. So, you know, I will always be stubbing my toes. I think I, I don't have any feeling left in my toes because I just kick them so frequently. Um and I'd always be walking around quite unsure, never really knowing what my next step would be. Um, walking around Mittagong, I'm still okay to do that because, you know, I've got a general idea. But ever leaving the town, I always felt a lot more secure when I had someone else that was with me and I could, you know, have my hand on their arm or, or you know, follow along right on the back of their shoulder so I could get a lay of the land. You know, having a cane, even going over to Barrel, or which is just the next town over, in our little kind of country cluster um, was always a little bit daunting. So I just didn't know it as well. Going to Sydney was petrifying. because I was always running into things, falling over things. Um, you know, I think I, I think I may have addressed a statue as a human at one point. I, I don't know, but having a cane, uh, it kind of gave me the confidence to be able to actually walk, walk normally, walk tall and um, kind of own my own movements, which was something that I found to be hugely beneficial um considering i'm an athlete and i'm used to being so sure of my body and where it was um in a gym or a pool or um not having that same kind of assurance when i was merely just walking around was a little bit frustrating um and then i was directed to to blind to vision australia and i did get a little bit of mobility training and it's just given me that little bit of confidence to actually walk and interact with my world and and to to seek out um new experiences on my own sort of thing and I suppose that's what it's given me a lot more yeah, confidence definitely because obviously I was as you was talking then I was thinking about the fact that you're a Paralympic athlete and you know yourself so confident when you're on the snow but not having or at the time you didn't have that same like you said hold your, your head high um, it's interesting to know that that support wasn't there I believe 
when you're in a Sydney Metro school, you, depending on when you're obviously diagnosed, that ISTV is kind of linked up from a much younger age and they recommend, um, I've been to a lot of school programs where kids walk around school with their cane from kindy right through. So um, definitely it might be a feature that maybe Brad speak on your experience. How, do you use any um, accessibility tools to get around? Yeah, I use a few, nothing as important as the cane. I got training with it in primary school, but didn't really use it until about year eight in high school where I'd keep running into people or like causing accidents. And I got sick of having to explain myself and getting into fights and stuff. So the, I brought it to not only help me avoid those situations, but also to identify myself as a vision impaired person. Cause I don't like my eyes move functionally so they don't really give off the effect that I'm blind so no one really knew until I had my vision cane but um other tools I use is a lot of phone apps like seeing AI so if I'm, if I'm in a restaurant I can hold my phone up above the the menu and it'll read out all the words for me but yeah. other than that yeah it's just the cane and some phone apps here and there yeah. So with those, there's two questions I want to go from there. With those phone apps, will collate a list of those um, specifically for the ones that you guys use and send them out to everyone after? Because I know the longer I've been working in this role, the more I learn about them. Um, I'll put them on Facebook and then everyone can just submit in the ones they use because I've heard some people love the same or there's some really hit and miss about some of the other ones. Um, but on the other half of that question, I wanted to know, and I, I jotted it down here, what it is like sometimes living with an invisible, in air quotes, disability, someone where, unless you've got that white cane, people sometimes don't, or, or guide dog, um, people sometimes don't recognise that disability that you might have. I'll, I'll start with Mel, only because you're nodding along, like you definitely agree with this. Um, and um, maybe Louise and Brad can speak to it too. Yeah, I... Uh... It's very different, I suppose, because at home and, and at work, a lot of my patients, when they first come in to see me, I'm a, I'm a, I'm a physiotherapist, so when my patients first come in to see me, they've got no idea that I'm blind. Um, my treatment room is right at the front of the clinic. I don't have to kind of navigate around anything. All of my, my treatment spaces is basically set up with everything. I know exactly where everything is in my room. I know distances. It's all mapped out perfectly. So none of my patients actually realize that I'm visually impaired um, unless they've known me from around the community. And then when they find out it's um, because I'm staring at my computer screen like 10 centimeters away from my face, they're just like, oh, you need glasses. I'm like, well, actually, <laughs> funny story, can't see. Um, so it's, I've always find that. And then they're, they're actually seeing their visceral reactions of like, oh, wow, okay, this is Oh, and some of them are actually quite put off and some of them are very intrigued and very interested and ask a lot of questions, um, which I find to be really awesome. You know, I'm always up for education um, mm -hmm. over ignorance. I think that's really cool. Um, but then, so, you know, having, having that hidden disability or people, they sometimes brush it aside thinking that, you know, you're okay, you can just get around. Um, my mother is probably actually the worst one for this, believe it or not. Um, I often say that the worst guide I've ever had in my entire life is my mum because she forgets that I'm blind. Um, she forgets that I can't see. She forgets that I can't interact with, with the world um, as, as, an, as an average sighted person would. Um, so she's forever kind of, if I'm with her and I don't have a cane with me because I know I'm with someone that I know and trust and she'll often forget to tell me that there's a set of stairs or a pole and I like quite often fall into them or over them. <laughs> and then she remembers and feels bad and I really don't want her feeling bad, but it's, it's, I suppose it's good and bad to be able to skate by not being recognized as a, someone with a visual impairment. Um, I think everyone, would have experienced some form of, of bigotry or discrimination because they have, uh, you know, told someone that they're visually impaired or they have a cane or a guide dog with them. Um, I know I have, I, I have come across situations like that as recently as last week. So it's always nice sometimes to be able to skate under the radar, but then I think when you're having issues or when you do need that assistance and you don't um, have a cane or, or don't have a guide dog with you or, you know, speaking up, can also be quite challenging as well. Actually letting people know what your needs are um, mm. 
especially if you're out in the community and not with some friends or family that you trust, um, it's really quite daunting. I think living in the country, I'm a little bit more comfortable approaching people. I don't know, people seem to be a little bit more approachable out here. I do know in Sydney, if I was to approach someone and ask for help, I'd be very, very scared. Um, I don't know why that is. It might just be a country thing, but yeah. Um, that that lends on to the next question. But first, I'll, I'll, I'll let Brad answer that same you, question about the living within uh, sometimes invisible disability. Yeah, probably the most the thing I hear the most is, oh, if you didn't have that cane, I wouldn't know you're blind. My favorite thing that happens is I, I'll do some crazy things in dance. It takes a lot of practice to get them right, but like it'll be like jumping over a table or catching someone who's just done a jump. And because I don't have my cane up on stage, none of the audience members know, and I love just walking through the audience with my cane. Everyone's like, what? He's blind? It's actually my favorite thing when people don't realize I'm blind because then they go, oh, I can't even do that. I can see. So in that sense, you kind of get a double, double applause or double, you know. Um, yeah. I, I like that. That's a, that's a positive, positive spin on it. Like as Mel mentioned, and, and the next question to it is what are some of the best supports? Because sometimes that reaction isn't always great. And you, and you coined the phrase just then, I like education over ignorance, because if people do have a negative reaction, and they say something mean or they do something mean or whatever it might be have you found this a support um you refer them to a certain website or a resource or you just accept it and move on or you actually confront them and have a chat about it you know what do you find mel and then we'll maybe talk to louise um so i i've, I've done all of those things but it always depends on the person and how willing they are to um actually listen i suppose there's only so much knowledge you can shove down someone's throat. Um, sometimes it's a little bit, sometimes it's tons, sometimes it's none at all. Um, so I have people have actually, I've got one patient who specifically comes back and sees me because she's losing her vision at the age of 70. And she just comes back to see me about mobility stuff. And I'm just like, I, I'm, I'm, I'm the wrong person for this, but she's like, no, but you get it. I'm like, okay, cool. So with her, I'm sharing websites and um, like, taking her through a day-to-day -day life in the, in the house and the little tips and tricks that I use that she may not, um, that she may not have thought of um, being yeah. older. And I thought that's really cool because she come, she she found out that I was visually impaired and she came to see me to seek that knowledge specifically in regards to her mobility and safety around the home as an elderly um, and as an elderly woman. But then I've had other people who've approached me who just seem to think that I need fixing <laughs> um, and basically want to shove things down my throat like you know bionic eyes and oh I met this great surgeon over in America who's working with stem cells and all this kind of stuff and is completely unwilling to have any kind of talk or actually he's just trying to go no you can be fixed you can be fixed I'm like I don't need to be fixed there's nothing wrong with me I'm fine um I like myself I like my vision it's awesome but with those that particular subset of people I I don't waste my breath basically I'm like they're not willing to be educated they don't want to know so I'm not going to um I'm not going to waste my time because they're not going to pay any attention they have their own agenda and then there's other people who start asking curious questions and they they, they might pause for a while but then like if the conversation is flowing they might just throw another little tidbit in there and it's like you just you slowly educate them as to what people can do and like cool things that other visually impaired people in the world have done. And oh, maybe if you like, if you want to go check out um, like this documentary that one of my friends did, you know, you can kind of like steer them in certain places um, just to kind of get some education on how awesome visually impaired people, you know, are or uh, the things that we can achieve. Like Brad was saying, like some of the stuff that he does is awesome. Um, and hell, I can't dance. <laughs> No, um, either. I'm not even going to try jumping on that one. <laughs> uh, yeah. <laughs> so it's, you know, just like lending them towards things that's like just because we have a visual impairment means like we, we, we skirt around things, you know, we can, we always figure it out. And I think that's been the main take home from my life is like you'll figure it out. And there's a way to do anything that you want to be able to do. So um, I think, yeah, that's basically it. It's like I do all those things. Um, I try and educate when I can. I, deep dive into different educational tools if people want me to do if the people are asking me for that feedback and then I also just walk away because sometimes the fight is just way too hard and it's going to be fruitless yeah definitely well it's a really good positive attitude to have and obviously you are a person first before 
that anyway. So you're, you're a physio, you know, Brad does all the sports that he does and he's obviously studying those degrees, which we'll learn in a second. So you're a person first, this happens to be part of it. Um, so obviously educating them to know that, you know, your great achievements and others, they all still can coexist um, beside that vision loss. So then Louise, if you're talking about that, are there any supports that you find you've tried to at least look out or source for Brad, considering that some people might treat him differently than maybe your other children with his vision impairment? Yes, well, the, it's um, the first thing you find is people have this great sadness for you. So it, it, education is very important and letting people know that every one of us has an ability and it's not the disability that defines your your child or, you know, your, yourself. Um, and it's, it's amazing how when people stop, think, oh, yes, we're all people and it's how we go about. So when we realised um, we, it was very difficult to get a diagnosis for Bradley, um, just because people were the specialists were quite unsure so in that meantime we had to just set up um you know with vision australia and with guide dogs so we are lucky we do have people here but it's it's a very big wait list um or it's hard to get um time but we once we've worked it out we then can go right we can achieve this goal we can achieve that goal and, and you move on but it's it's about talking to people with same vision um, and, and what have they done and you'll find a lot haven't done much it's just that when the someone else in the family said oh I did this and they go oh where did you go and then you get that help um, definitely sharing information um, and being able to get to Newcastle and Sydney um, has been a, a very big big step in making Bradley uh, the person he is today mm -hmm. uh, just having that uh, the group that is a uh, friendship group that he has with uh, the same like uh, disabilities has been absolutely brilliant yeah so I'm understanding obviously surrounding yourself by communities of like-minded people and who understand um, who might understand what you're going through or understand right. that, like you said you are a person first with all these amazing abilities um, and the skills that you have are uh, outweigh you know what you might have lost in that vision so then ask uh, Brad because living where you do there might be a few less job opportunities or less unis to study I know if you're in Sydney you can go to a plethora of different universities um, you mentioned briefly what you're studying. Could you remind us again and then let us know how you picked that and um, maybe what jobs you do or don't have access to um, through support of that course that you've chosen? Yeah, um, so the most current course I'm doing right now is a Cert 3 in business. So it's just like some administration basics. I have in the past done a Cert 3 in personal fitness and um, in November, when COVID restrictions light, lighten up, I'll be doing some courses with the Australian Weightlifting Federation to help coach uh, um, sports like CrossFit. And uh, there's a lot of fitness in Tamworth, <laughs> so it's good that I enjoy fitness and want to do that. But it has been hard to get a job with my disability and people worrying about having to change too much in their workplace for O H and S safety reasons and that. So I've been uh, working with best employment to not only help like get the job and have a bit of funding for um, uh, accessibility changes in the workplace, but also to just help my confidence with um, finding a job. Yeah, for sure. You mentioned um, the your weightlifting the one coming up soon. I know I can see in the participants here, we've got Johnny. He's looking at doing powerlifting. So I might put you two in touch because uh, okay, sure. he was having a discussion the other day when we are at football. Um, and I know that's probably a popular one where it's not a Paralympic recognized because they've got to have a limb loss for that one. Yeah. But it still has uh, IBSA, uh, IBSA Games. Um, and I believe they'll do an Oceania one. I did a bit of research the other day. So I know 
on that level, you'll have a some network and a support there. Um, and you did mention that people, or you, and to use your words, were worried and they didn't want to make too many changes in their workplace. Mel, have you found, because I'm assuming there might just be one physio clinic where you are, unless there's multiple, did they, when you initially joined them, have to make any changes or adaptations in the workplace for you? And were they hesitant to? Um, so there's, as we're growing, there are more physio clinics around. Um, I, part of physiotherapy training is we need to actually work in, we essentially do six months full-time unpaid work as like an internship as part of our university degree. So when I'm being hired or when I was being looking at um, getting a job, um, whoever was hiring me was already assured because I had the qualification that I could do the job, I suppose. So I think that was already that, um, which was nice. Two of the clinics that I got put in for placement offered me work straight out of university. Um, however, I didn't go with either one of those because they were a bit too far away and mobility was going to be a bit of an issue getting there. And one of them was in a big multi gym kind of setup and I couldn't really control my environment too well. So I didn't feel a hundred percent confident or I wouldn't have felt a hundred percent confident on a day-to-day -day basis, just too many variables going around. Um, luckily my physio, so the guy who actually treated me, um, who was my physiotherapist before I became a physio. Um, I asked him if he had any jobs going at his clinic, uh, relatively small. There was three physios working at the time and I would have been, I, when I started, I was a fourth. And so he knew me, he knew that I was relatively capable, um, which was awesome. And we sat down and we had a really frank discussion basically. And I think being in healthcare and physiotherapy, like the name of our game is adaptable, like being adaptable and being flexible and figuring out like problem solving. We, physiotherapy is basically anatomical problem solving on a daily basis. So um, luckily my boss didn't really see my vision as a barrier. Um, he saw it as something that could be worked around and he actually sees it as a positive. Um, you know, he really, he really values the, I have a different skill set and a different way to approach things um, because I can't just look at a movement. You know, sometimes I have to feel someone moving properly. Um, hands-on physiotherapy skills I'm like I'm he's like you're light years ahead of anyone else who came out the same year as you um so he kind of took all of the positives into hiring me and found that they far outweighed the potential changes that they needed to make around the clinic um things that you know they've had to kind of adopt is um just making sure certain pathways always stay clear so I'm not going to fall over things um like I said, I have a certain treatment room and it always irritates the hell out of me when other people are in there and they move stuff around because it's been, I spend all day trying to find something. Um, so I kind of got to a point where I was just like, I, every time I asked him to come in and find something for me, he's like, how about I just like not move anything in here? I'm like, that would be really good. He's like, okay, cool. That's what we'll do from now on. I'm like, there we go. <laughs> and then they just helped me get access to a computer that had a really good screen that I could ex like made sure I could um, expand everything. They helped me out with job access so I could get um, dictation software for my notes. Um, and then they, they just made sure the other big accommodation that the clinic made for me is I've got longer appointment times than anybody else. So uh, because it takes me a little bit longer to do the admin, maybe a little bit longer to do some of my assessment based work for first patients, they, they give me, they give me quite willingly a little bit more time to do, to treat, um, which has been a really big help it made me feel like I'm not like I'm still you know doing a job but they've given me those accommodations and they've never batted an eyelid yeah so it sounds like initially when you were looking it was a consideration it wasn't a, a drawback but it's something you considered you know you talked about that big complex but yeah. now it's I, I would never even thought about that the fact that yes of course you might have to feel the movement rather than see it but it's it could enhance your skills because you're you're focusing on that repetitively more than anyone else might be you know yeah. your words light years ahead yeah um, so and that's it and any and it was it was right from the get-go it was um open communication you know they needed to know what I needed and then they needed to be frank as to whether they could deliver that mm. um and I think that's the big key thing when you're looking for a job out there um anywhere it's like know exactly what you need to be able to perform the job that you want to perform mm. and 
you know, some, some workplaces are going to be able to give you that um, and others that can't. And frankly, the ones who can't, I don't think you'd want to be working there anyway. So, yeah, that's true. Um, yeah, on that same thread about work, then you mentioned a few, you said you use a magnified text. Do you use a screen reader directly at work? And Brad, doing uni, do you do the same? Uh, I don't use a screen reader. I don't like them. Um, that's why I ask. I've heard all the reviews, so like I just like to know, and I'm sure everyone here would like to know why you do and why you don't. So as I, I think my my stem of disliking screen readers came from um, from when I was a kid. So I, I didn't have a huge amount of access to mobility training or blind. Um, well, it used to be called the Blind Society when I was a kid. Mm -hmm. um, it was that. For, it wasn't even Vision Australia then. It was the Blind Society. Uh, so we didn't really have meant much support out here. So I never really got access to screen readers or any of that sort of technology, audio books, anything like that. So I basically figured out how to read print and I've always just been more comfortable with it. I blow things up. So I have like magnifiers on my computer if I need to use them. Um, I can still read print. It just takes me a bit longer. Um, so yeah, I've only started experimenting with screen readers and I haven't found one that I actually can tolerate for more than about 20 minutes. So um, shout out in Facebook groups, anyone, if you've got a screen reader that's actually good and doesn't make me want to throw my device at a wall in frustration, that would be awesome. Well, if you do throw it, the other day I was scrolling Facebook and I saw an ad for a remote control blow up 360 uh think of a pool inflatable so you put your playstation in or your phone and it's got a perspex screen so you can see what you're doing but it means that in that moment of anger on the xbox or the playstation or whatever equivalent and you throw it at the wall your remote doesn't break because i know on here there'd be a few gamers and everyone i've spoken to has that moment where they've broken a remote or two or dropped their iphone in frustration um, so it's a tool i know that i might be bothering my brother for christmas that could be a good one. I think I'd invest in that for my brothers as well. Yeah. Uh, Brad, screen readers for yourself? I don't have, I don't like using the ones where they read the words to you, but I do occasionally use like voice to text. So I speak and it types out my text. It's especially helpful when I'm um, like, I've strained my eyes so much that I just, at the end of the day, I can't like read. So I'll just uh, say what I have to. But when it comes to like reading text, I have heaps of Zoom and bold features. And they usually invert the colors that have white writing on a black background rather than the other way around. Mm -hmm. mm. Definitely, that's one I'm familiar with. So not a, not a vision loss, but my father is color blind. So often if I send a document to him, sometimes I'll invert them or pick two colors that I know work with him. So that's a really good one. Um, yeah, especially... I always I always use dark themes on everything. So mm. light on black background has always been much easier for me to see as well, Brad. Um, and I do use dictation software. Sorry, yeah, I use um, Dragon Naturally Speaking, um, which is good. So that's actually a good dictation software. So I, I talk to my computer and it types for me. Um, but I, again, I only use it at the end of the day when my eyes are absolutely fried and just cannot focus on anything anymore. I think I could use that and I'm not blind. I was about to say, personally, <laughs> Perfect. Perfect I use those all the time. I've already put that function on my laptop because I find, you know, when you're having a conversation to someone and you just say things and a sentence tends to flow and as long as you're not poor English, like that sentence was, <laughs> on the whole, you can write a document. So I lot of, used to do a lot of my uni essays by speaking to my iPhone on the trip home or walking around the block. And I know that's not a feature specifically designed for me, but it's one that both people with vision impairment and without can all use and optimize and, and love. So it's one that um, a lot of these adaptations, although they might not be specific to vision loss, you know, really do help you and me together. On that same thread, then we're talking about the inverted colors and, and things that everyone can live with and everyone can adapt with. I want to go to Louise and ask, and this is a very big one. It might not have a lot of, of options in Tamworth, or, but if you're buying a house, building a house, renting your, your apartment or anything, do you consider or did you have to consider Brad in 
the setup of your couch, how far he is from the TV or the equipment that you put in the kitchen for him if he's ever cooking dinner. Don't know if he does. <laughs> um, anything about that around the house, around home? Yeah, so Bradley actually loves to cook and um, for quite some time, constantly burning himself, uh, couldn't see where the water would come up to the measuring. Um, so ingredients were very difficult. So we um, had to do quite a bit of work trying to work out how can we improve this. Um, we did get a thermo mix, so happy days. We have the most beautiful meals cooked by Bradley. Uh, when he was younger, we thought about when we went to move into our second house, uh, what should we be looking for? Should we not get the stairs? Should we not get sunken land? Should we not? And then we got the probably the worst house. It had many stairs. It's three stories. <laughs> Uh, but Bradley we're fixing the lights it, right now don't you Bradley yeah well we're yeah, fixing the, lighting, the lights right now lighting is the biggest yeah and lighting is the biggest issue if you have no depth perception it really does uh cause that angst of oh my gosh I'm falling all the time so having that good lighting um it, it is really important and the kitchen we've set up a really good area so Bradley loves everything in the same spot like Mel said and that's really really important to have that consistency um, down to clothing down to where the towels are it, it has to be um, very very organized yeah I'm sure the the the, the house then stays as speak and span as I can with three kids but you know, everything is in its place so that Brad can navigate around the home in a way that's comfortable for him and um, is optimised that way. And it's not a... Sorry, you go. I was going to say, and just without his cane, because when you're at home, he feels that like that's his safe area. And once you've navigated your, your zone, you know exactly where you are. So um, not having to have that cane is, is very empowering in, in your own home. Yeah, I agree. One of, the, um, one of the things that we'd love to do, Louise, I think after these Zooms and, and get that stuff up is obviously this technology. I, I do a bit of work with some guys that actually have the Siri home um, system for their lighting even. Um, that tell So they can even tell their lighting what colour they want their light. So bright white is very good for me when I do the boxing with them, they like. So I think that's a great thing that we going forward that we, we can actually get as much technology out there for people. Because as you said, unless people meet each other at sporting events or recreation events, then they talk about it. So if we can have that on our website and stuff that people can look up, that'd be great. Cool. Yeah, that sounds great, Jason. No, I definitely agree on that. I read an article about, and that's specifically why I asked about the house building. I read an article on someone who was, she was hopeful and she had a bit of funding. And this is my next question, a bit of funding to make adaptions to where she was living. And it was an apartment um, because she lived alone and she wanted to, that independence. But the first thing she did was install, I don't know if they're what the ones Jason mentioned, but the, the lights where you could change the dimming and change the color and do it on voice command. So you don't have to go to the light switch. It can be where you are as the light, you know, if I'm sitting here working at my desk during the day, the light changes. So making sure that that worked for her and her ability. So that's something that, you know, if I do find out those full details, I'd love to share um, because from what I read, they were simple light bulbs. Funnily it's enough, it's, it's about an $80 gizmo that you can yeah. put onto your thing and then the lights are about $10 to $20 each. So, it's, yeah, it's not a huge amount of dollars. So, mm. make a massive difference. I like it. And I'm like I said, I'm not visually impaired myself. I love going into his house and just talking to Siri to turn the lights on. <laughs> <laughs> I have one of those. Well, we did try... I was going to say, we just um, tried a couple of uh, times and we've been knocked back twice um, mm -hmm. to make those changes for Bradley um, yeah. because you just need a wider um, a sort of coverage than what we um, had and we got knocked back. And there was quite, there's quite a few things that you, you knock back. So there are things that you've got to work on yourself mm -hmm. um, and, and that makes it a bit tricky. You know, with cost and things like that, because it 
if you 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 want some assistance it's it can be very difficult to get it so things like that would what you're saying jason that's great to know because they are cost effective for a family um who you know has to pay bills and and can't go and change every single light bulb you know um not the light bulb the whole fitting yeah um it makes it a bit tricky yeah that's the one i was reading and and then so on that same discussion louise if we stay there for a minute what current goals if we're talking about the NDIS planning and i know it's specific to every um you might have your local area coordinator but we've got some people on this zoom at the moment and some who are new to our community who don't know a lot about the goals you set and you just said you're restricted in what you've got can you maybe talk about what what is your current plan with brad and what you think you might extend it to to fit some sport in adaptations to your home um any of that area well our plan actually is just about to come um up for reviewing and we we've actually wouldn't be able to do the things that we have done um and bradley to be independent without the nds so the nds is is wonderful but it's very very hard work and sadly you you have to continue to prove um that you need this assistance um we've got a good little system now um but yes we're where we would love to take it even further to be able to use it in different ways but you need a lot of backing to be able to so it's a can be very frustrating and there's a lot of families who won't actually even start it because to be able to get all this information and to prove that you you really require it it's very difficult but we've been uh with NDIS probably about five years so we have been very lucky um and Bradley um, it's really helped, especially uh, this year. COVID was terrible because you couldn't use it. So we couldn't get anyone there. We didn't get, like a lot of people got assistance, financial assistance, disability um, pension never changed. So no one could come and see them. Um, guide dogs put Zoom on, which um, calls on, which was fantastic. We've got that through NDS um, to, to have those. And Bradley met a lot of different people. Uh, and kids so it was fantastic but there was there's it's always very hard work we're always working all the time to get anything for your child in place so that when they become an adult they're independent there's a lot of hard work it does it does seem that way it provides a lot of independence but it requires a lot of independence or knowledge and, and hard work. Mel, are you on the NDIS? Do you find it benefits you? And do you think because you live rurally, it changes your access to the maybe services that might be under the NDIS? Um, so I tried the NDIS when it was first rolled out in my area. Mm -hmm. um, I, I, and I'm actually, so I'm currently not on it actually um i got halfway through the application process at the first time through and it was literally just it was so hard um it was impossible to navigate constantly proving that i needed a system and constantly all these different reports and all this kind of stuff just trying to chase it up it was just it was an absolute nightmare um because i'd existed so long outside of the visually impaired world um so i wasn't a member of um vision australia at the time or i hadn't had any contact with vision australia until I got my cane so I wasn't on their list as a child or anything like that like that list wasn't handed over to the NDIA um or my name wasn't on the list that was handed to the NDIA essentially so I, I basically had to prove all the way from the get-go that I had a legal visual impairment that wasn't likely to change and all the rest of that sort of jazz um with traveling overseas every four to six months it honestly just got the process wasn't like a couple of week long process it was like months and months and months and I'm just like Honestly, I gave it up. <laughs> I couldn't be bothered. And it was just too hard. Every time I thought about going back and doing it again, I had another overseas trip kind of pending in, in two to three months. Um, so I just kept putting it on the back burner. So I'm still not on it. I would dearly probably, honestly, mobility wise and, and, and financially, it would be a massive benefit. Um, but I just, I haven't got onto it yet. <laughs> so maybe that's something that we can work as, us at blind sports with our recreation. I know that we target a lot of 
goals within your NDS plans to mean that it's not out of pocket and you can access them, um, but we can work with you or, or these providers to see how it might be a bit of an easier process. I know that support letters can be written by our team to let you know um, that we've done those for a few people um, because obviously that's, like you said, they require a lot of documentation um, and it gives them a budget of how much you need to access this adaptive sport. For instance, Brad and, and doing tennis, golf and goalball, they all require different equipment. And I'm sure, I don't know much about the snow and skiing, but Mel, you would probably know that you might have some adaptations that the NDIS could provide um, a bit of financial support. So if we can work together, maybe over the next few months and discuss any of those, uh, might make it an easier process for our Paralympic athletes right down to the families who just already time poor with three kids and do work and everything like that. I think I think one of our topics and one of our one of our um, webinars might be just on NDIS because there's a there's a huge amount that we can do with those support letters, with, which we already have done for some some athletes and just talking about it as and and that's what we were saying earlier. Just everyone getting on and being able to talk about it will help everyone. So um, yeah. Definitely. Um, I just want to yes, end up with, yeah, with a few really good um, resources that you find just in general. Um, I, we've mentioned here Guide Dogs, Vision Australia, obviously our, our White Canes. Um, I know Blind Citizens Australia is another good resource. We're working in Sydney with the Save Sight Institute, which is Sydney Uni. But are there anything out rurally you find? Um, it could be a network. A Facebook group, an app that we haven't mentioned. If you had the chance to chat to someone and tell them your top thing, this would be it. We'll start with Mel, maybe. If there's nothing, that's fine. I'm really bad with the accessible apps. Um, to be honest with you, I if I want to blow uh, if I want to blow a restaurant menu up, I use my my camera on my phone. Um, <laughs> If I if I want need to get somewhere, I use Google Maps. Um, and on an iPhone, Dragon Dragon naturally speaking software would probably be my massive big tip. That's probably the best dictation software going around. And for the professionals out there, they have a lot of um, professional suite stuff as well. So I actually use the medical one, so I don't need to type in every single medical term that I need that I actually speak. It recognizes that, and I think they have ones for business, and I think they have also ones for law as well. So that would be my go-to. That would be my my one app that I that I use and love. I'm just going to write that one down in the chat. What was that one? It, uh, Dragon, naturally speaking. That way we've got it. And and Brad, is there anything um, else, any other tools, networks, groups that you've used? Well, the Seeing, a Seeing AI app is definitely mm -hmm. one of my favourites. It can read whole documents or just like snippets, read them out to you. And they're trying to put more features onto it as well, like reading currency. Um, and I do a lot of work on my iPad and my iPhone. So I have a HDMI cord adapter. So right now my phone, while it's here doing the camera, it's connected to my TV. So I've got it in like extra big. And another thing is with iPhones, you can go on accessibility and it's got a pretty good zoom function. So you just double tap the screen with three fingers and it zooms in however much you want it to. I use that a lot. <laughs> Definitely. I learned that feature um, when we had our intern Taylor in the office. She installed that onto my Mac that we were able to swap over together. I use it all the time now. Again, some features that weren't designed for me, but now I love. So yes, echo that one for sure. Um, Louisa, anything? And Bradley, else? what about, yes, there was one uh, for just school children. Um, Bradley, what did you use for Word, um, Word or um, writing stories and things like that or uploading? Um, at school? Oh, uh, I used UPad was an app I used. That's a pay, you have to pay for that one. Mm -hmm. um, it's like a PDF file. So it will send, when I was at school, the teachers would send workbooks, like the paper workbooks in an email. And I would, um, I could then like draw on it with like a iPad pencil and stuff. So and then print it out and it looked like I did exactly the same work as everyone else in the class. 
That's a new one. I haven't heard of that one. So I'll definitely, I've written here UPAD, U-P-A-D or Y-O-U. Yeah, I think it's U-P-A-D. I'll just double check for you. That's all right. And so while you check that, I wanted to end off because we know at the moment it's a COVID time, it's affecting us very strongly um, in Sydney where we're, we're physically distanced or isolated from each other. Um, but I, I feel that might be something that you regionally or rurally would know a bit more than us um, and how that might affect your mental health or who you reach out to when you're feeling down or separated or isolated from the people who are close to you. Um, so again, Brad, is there anything you do um, when you're feeling just not so good or when you feel like your friends are far away? Um, if I'm not feeling really good, I try and <laughs> do a bit of an exercise, work it out thing, or pace it out and have around the house. Um, and if I'm feeling a bit left out with friends, I might like put myself out there and just call one up or organize an event, even if it's far in the future, just so I know that I'll be hanging with them soon, eventually sort of things. Nothing too crazy. Yeah, stuff we're all probably familiar with by now. Giving that friend a call is um, one that I know I've started scheduling them into my diary. <laughs> Just a phone call, but it makes a big difference. Mel, do you do similar? Uh, yeah, I think during COVID, like, um, so I don't have the luxury of living with anyone. I live alone. Uh, so COVID last year was especially horrible for me. Um, <laughs> like everybody else or like most a lot of people in, in New South Wales and Victoria the world over so you know I got really good at um at phone calls I got much better at text messaging and trying to maintain connections with my friends that way um and that that's worked really well Every, our entire social group got a lot a lot better at at texting and messaging which was kind of cool so we're all in a lot more frequent contact and it could just be something as simple as, you know, a weird meme that we, that we send that's like, Hey, thinking of you sort of thing, just almost like just a reaching out and tapping them on the shoulder just to know that they're not alone. And a lot of my mates do that for me now as well, which is kind of cool. Um, group chats, I, every now and again, we'll all jump on a, jump on a call when we're cooking dinner or, you know, when we're all at home doing nothing much. Um, I think I was talking to one of my best mates when I was vacuuming the other day, she kept whining about the noise. <laughs> but yeah, just, we do that kind of stuff. And I think that's, that's been the big thing. Um, you know, I'm really close to my family and luckily my brother, um, my brothers live quite close to me. So that's really, really cool. And I, so I was still able to see them, which was awesome, but that's about it. Um, yeah. So I think that's the big thing. Know that your, your family and your, your social circle is probably feeling the exact same way as you if you're feeling down or you're feeling detached or alone or lonely then you know other people in your friend group um, regardless of whether in the same living situation as you are feel, probably feeling the exact same way so um, reach out because they're probably jonesing for that human connection just as much as you are um, I think that's something that I've really taken away from from COVID it's like everybody everybody needs that connection um, regardless of whether they're asking for it or not so it's like it's always cool to reach out and it's cool to ask yeah, I could not agree more. And I want to echo the fact that if anyone from our community or anyone you guys know is feeling a bit isolated, whether it be COVID pandemic effects or, or a recent vision diagnosis or anything along the lines, uh, feel free to contact us um, personally through the Facebook Messenger. We can have a quick chat anytime. There's a few of us who man that um, or feel free to send us an email. The team can answer it info at blindsportsnsw.com.au because we do know that obviously it's a very tough time at the moment um no one has to have an excuse we're here we'd love to support sports and rec obviously our focus but humans we all we all care we want to make sure you are all right um i'll let jason kind of do a bit of a wrap up a bit of a thank you um and then i'll introduce what we've got up on our next panel yeah, thanks, Bill. Look, I just thank you to Mel and Louise and Brad. That was great for our, our first um, webinar. One thing that I really took out of today um, that I'd like to comment on is that um, just speaking to you guys, I, I really feel that sometimes you probably are lucky being in, in, in the country because everything that you guys spoke about 
the small communities, people knowing you have a lot more help there as well. So uh, where you might lack in some sport facilities and, and being able to do the sports and stuff, I think you really sounds to me like you have that real community sort of feel and, and friendships and stuff in that community. So um, obviously we can help you try with the sports. We'll do our best to, to help you in that way. But I really feel that maybe you guys are probably luckier than some of the city guys to the, the friendships and family friends you have. So I certainly would uh, much rather live in the country. Um, city has its benefits, but I, I just love the country. Same. Louise and Brad, country, staying there, love it, live it. Yeah, I can't deal with the city. <laughs> I deal <laughs> with it when I have to, but it's just too crowded. The country's small, quiet, and it's got the people I need, so it's fine. <laughs> I'll stay here. Yes, one good thing with the city that it provides that opportunity. So we're happy to to come home. Um, I might retire on the coast. I think though that'd be quite nice to wake up to the beach. Yeah, um, but <laughs> there's country coast too. That works too. <laughs> yeah, that's right. Yeah, so it'll be definitely a small town, country coastal uh, area. Um, nothing too flash or big. Yeah, but um, yeah, definitely nice and quiet. That sounds wonderful. <laughs> Um, so I just um, forgot there too. Thanks, Bill, for um, obviously putting a lot of this together and hopefully our, our um, following webinars that we'll get you guys back on to, to help and, and listen as well. I'm definitely interested in the NDIS one. I think I saw a couple of others there that sounded kind of cool too. So I'll be back. Sounds good. So yes. Yep. That's great. It was great. Thank you. That's all right. So we'll sign it off there tonight. Thank you, everyone. But like we said, reach out if you need. Um, and everyone, have a good evening. See ya. Thank you. Bye. Thanks, see ya. See you guys. Thanks for jumping on.